our next talk, you are, you are in South Seas CDF. Our next talk is Critical Zero Days, Remotely Compromised, the Most Popular Real-Time OS, with Ben Zeri and Do Zussman. Hey. hey, guys, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, so my name is Ben Seri. I'm the VP of Research at Armis. And today with me is Doris Zussman, who's a researcher on my team. Dor. Hey. <laughs> uh, also in the crowd, we have uh, Greg uh, Vishnipolsky, which is uh, also part of our research team and is a big part of the research that we are presenting today. Armis is an agentless IT security company which, which is focused on securing, securing IoT devices and, and unmanaged devices in both enterprise, industrial, and medical organizations. In the last year, we've noticed a particular brand of real-time operating system that is extensively used by industrial and medical devices. So we decided to take it apart and see if we can find any interesting vulnerabilities in it. This research resulted in the discovery of 11 critical zero-day vulnerabilities in the TCPIP stack used by this popular real-time operating system named VxWorks. So we're going to start um, a bit about VxWorks, just uh, where is it used, uh, why is it still very relevant today. Uh, then we're going to cover a bit the history of vulnerabilities in the uh, TCP IP stack implementation, various operating systems. Then uh, we'll go a bit about the actual findings of our research, the Urgent 11 uh, research, and a technical deep dive on some of the more interesting of these uh, 11 vulnerabilities. Uh, lastly, if we, if we actually have time, um, we'll show an interesting, interesting case study of a hospital bedside patient monitor that we have here today, uh, and we'll attempt to do a live demo of this as well. So going back to VxWorks, what, what is VxWorks and why should you care about it? VxWorks is a real-time operating system. It is owned by a company named Wind River and is actually used by more than 2,000 device manufacturers as the basis for their uh, device that they, that they manufacture. So Wind River produces the code, the VxWorks software, but then there are over 2,000 companies that take the source code, this operating system, uh, and use it as the underlying OS for their devices. Real-time operating systems excel at being compact and reliable, uh, such that can deliver deterministic timings for various tasks running on top of a priority-based scheduler. These features usually fit well with various embedded devices, and VxWorks is used extensively in many different devices. Um, it is the most popular real-time operating system in the market and actually runs on over 2 billion devices. That's the same number of devices that you would find powering Android or Windows devices. Unlike these operating systems, however, this OS suffers from lack of research uh, in its 32 years of existence, only 13 CVEs were found affected and are listed uh, by Mitre. Now that number has uh, gone up to 24 due to our research, but it is still um, under-researched extensively. In comparison, when you look at Android, for example, this OS has more than 2,000 CVEs uh, listed that affected, and it exists for only a quarter of the time. So there is much more research to be done in real-time operating systems and VX work specifically. VxWorks is used everywhere. You actually find it in almost every industry, uh, from healthcare to manufacturing, aerospace, uh, even uh, automotives, defense, security, all of these. Um, all of these industries use devices that require these types of real-time operating systems, require these types of reliable, um, compact, and highly, um, again, highly reliable systems. It is used by the most, uh, the biggest companies in each of their respective fields. In industrial devices, you will find it in Rockwell Automation, in Schneider Electric. Um, in medical devices, you find it in Philips and GE, and it's in Siemens. All over uh, the industries, you find um, really big companies using VxWorks as their uh, go-to solution. And, uh, and uh, even uh, a famous example of this is, is NASA which also uses VxWorks uh, to drive their spacecraft and some of the Mars rovers as well. Okay, so going back to TCP IP stacks, why are they an interesting subject for uh, research, uh, vulnerability research? So in many regards, they are considered the holy grail of vulnerability research. To find a vulnerability 
in the core networking stack of an operating system is really something that uh, can allow an attacker a great, uh, a great a lot of uh, power. Um, this is because a couple of things. First of all, these protocols, the TCP IP protocols, they go back to the 80s. Uh, they, are, they haven't changed uh, since. So if you find a vulnerability in the implementation of such uh, protocol, uh, it, it, it won't change. The code won't uh, uh, be changed almost at all. So you can bet that, that the vulnerability you find uh, really remains uh, in the code as well. In addition, the network stack of any operating system will be running inside the kernel in ring zero, so with the highest privileges that you can imagine. And by nature, if you find a vulnerability in a TCP IP stack, it will be remotely exploitable, right? So it's the network stack of the device. If you find a vulnerability in the implementation of the network stack, you can send packets that will trigger the, vul the vulnerability. In the past, uh, this, uh, uh, there were some examples of vulnerabilities in TCP IP stacks. Back in the 90s, we had a couple of these that affected uh, Windows devices. Uh, you might remember the famous WinUke vulnerability. You had this nice pop-up. You click a button, and it crashed any Windows 95 and NT uh, device. Um, and it, surprisingly, even today, there are examples of this. Last year, uh, there was uh, this vulnerability in the macOS and iOS from Apple. Um, again, a denial of service attack that crashed these devices by sending a single ICMP packet, especially a crafted one. In most cases, though, vulnerabilities discovered in the core network stack wouldn't uh, arise to actually being remote code executions. It's a, rare, it's a rare case. And there will more often be denial of service, resource exhaustion, um, all kind of these uh, vulnerabilities that are critical and uh, important, but not remote code execution necessarily. What we found is actually six vulnerabilities that are remote code execution, uh, and an additional five that are information leaks in RF service and logical flaws. Together, these 11 critical uh, vulnerabilities impact the TCP IP stack used by VxWorks called IPNet. And this stack is the default built-in TCP IP stack for VxWorks in the last 13 years since version 6.5. As I mentioned before, VxWorks uh, powers around 2 billion devices. And our estimate is that these vulnerabilities affect hundreds of millions uh, of that uh, 2 billion uh, total number. Uh, some of the VxWorks based devices don't have networking necessarily, but the ones that do, the majority of them would be impacted by this. The IPNet stack, uh, it, like I said, is the default built in stack from VxWorks. It is now owned and maintained by Wind River as part of their, um, as part of VxWorks essentially, but in the past it was actually part of another company, uh, Interpeak, and it was then sold to other real-time operating systems. This is part of 2006. So in the past you'd find IPNet in Green Hills Integrity, uh, ThreadX, and OSC. Uh, the disclosure process we've done with these vulnerabilities started in March, so it's been a five-month disclosure process. Um, a very complicated one, I think, in the sense that, again, there are many, many impacted vendors here. Um, and like uh, we, we saw in the week past, so we, we published this uh, last week, and since then, actually, there have been many, many uh, advisories like this, uh, companies that uh, come forward and say, we're impacted by this, we're working on a patch, uh, and we're trying to meet, and we are offering some mitigation paths. So we saw this in uh, Philips medical devices, uh, industrial devices from Rockwell and Schneider, and some uh, enterprise uh, type devices like Xerox printers. Another interesting example is the Sonicwell firewall, um, a firewall that is based on VxWorks, and that device had actually, uh, or still has, around a million of these, these, these firewalls um, exposed to the internet, and you can find them on Shodan. Uh, Sonicwell also released the patch and encouraged, and I also do this, if you're a Sonicwell firewall user, please go ahead and install that patch, because the exposure there is very real. Okay, so, um, like I said, we found 11 vulnerabilities, and they are actually throughout various subsystems of the TCP IP stack. There is one vulnerability in the IP stack, there are various vulnerabilities in the, uh, sorry, one vulnerability in the IP subsystem, various vulnerabilities in the TCP subsystem, um, a couple of, in the DHCP, IGMP, even, and, and even one very interesting and uh, funny vulnerability in uh, a protocol you might have not heard of, called reverse ARP, and we'll touch on that as well. 
Um, so we won't have time to actually cover all of it. We did publish a white paper, and you, you're welcome to go and read it. Uh, but we are going to touch a couple of these, the most interesting of them. And Dora will start with the Ike one, uh, cover that. Okay, so the first vulnerability that we're going to talk about resides inside of the IP parsing uh, system inside of the IP stack of VxWorks. And in order to understand it, we're going to need to have a little bit of background about IP and IP options and ICMP errors. This vulnerability is especially cool because we can do both things uh, that are cool. The first thing is that this vulnerability resides in the IP layer, meaning that we can send a broadcast packet and attack a whole bunch of these devices with just one packet and let's dive deep and see how it works. So we all know this, this is the IPv4 header and right at the bottom of it you have the IP options field. This field is used to extend the protocol and it basically consists of a type length value uh, options. Every options implement their own uh, type and then their own data structure inside of the value uh, field. Many of these options were released throughout the years and we're going to focus on a specific one called the source record routing. So these specific options allow an originating party of an IP packet to determine the destination in which the packet must go through, uh, the route in which the packet must go through to reach the destination. The security implications of it are obviously bad uh, just looking at what these options should do. And this is why it's a common practice not to allow uh, this IP option on your network. But to our surprise, VixWorks supports this to some degree. So as I mentioned, every option implements their own data structure. And in this case, it's a fairly simple one. You have a pointer which points to the current routing position and our route data, which basically is just an array of IP addresses. There are hops uh, for the packet to go through. So let's see how would a client sending such a packet would look like. First, the client needs to compose the route data, meaning that it has to put inside of the route data field all the hops that the packet must go through, and the last hop obviously being the actual destination. It needs to set destine the packet to the first hop, and then uh, set the pointer to the start of the route data. Once a router receives such a packet, it advances the pointer, put himself back in the list, and then sends the packet to the next hop. This happens successively until we reach the final router, which advances the pointer beyond the route data, and that way when the server uh, receives the packet, he knows that he is the final destination and not just a hop on the way, and he can start uh, parsing the packet. Now the RFC demands that when the server would like to answer a client that sends certain IP option, he would have to uh, use the same route that the packet took in order to reach to it, meaning that he would have to reverse the route data and send the packet back in the same manner, just in reverse. Okay, so there are many cases in which a server would like to answer an, a client IP packet, and one common one is ICMP errors. Some of you may already know this mechanism. Basically, it's a way for a server to report a network error, networking level error, without having an application layer that handles that error. In this case, you have a client sending an IP packet to a closed port uh, on the server, so no application is there to listen and receive and handle this packet, and the server would like to report to the client that there is a problem inside of the packet and he needs to handle it. So the server wraps the packet inside of an ICMP packet. It specified that the ICMP type is error, in this case port's unreachable because there is nothing listening on that port, and then he sends the packet back to the server. So as I mentioned, what happens when a client sends a packet with an SSRR option? As I mentioned, the RFC demands that the packet will use the same route back. So when the server will generate the ICMP error, it will have to copy the SSRR option back. This seems like a logical step, but what if I tell you that some of the things that can trigger an ICMP error is actually problems when parsing the IP option themselves? Now copying seems like a good idea. Not so sure. Let's see VixWorks take on this. So basically this is a very simplified overview of an IP uh, flow of an IP packet inside of VxWorks IP stack. And you can see that the packet takes first the first two stages. The, one, the first one is the routing logic, which determines uh, whether the packet is destined for us or needed to be routed. The second one is the validation step. And after the both steps, uh, the packet is considered validated and sanitized and can be later passed to the layer three handlers. So let's imagine an ICMP echo request has arrived. The first two stages occur. Now the packet is validated and sanitized. And now the ICMP handler would like to generate an echo response. 
So VxWorks tried to be generic and implement one function that creates an ICMP packet. In this case, IPNet ICMP for send. So the ICMP handler will call this function to generate the echo response. But as I mentioned, a lot of uh, a lot of the both of the first steps can fail and generate ICMP errors, and because VxWorks try to be generic, they use the same function. There's a couple of problems here. Of course, the design is kind of bad because this function does, is not aware which, which one called her, meaning that it can be called from errors from uh, branches and still assume the packet is validated. And let's see uh, some of the code. So this sum of the code of the function, it just tries to blindly copy all of the IP options to the new ICMP packet, and it just iterates through all of them and copies them. There's a couple of er uh, problems here. The first one is that it assumes the packet is validated and sanitized and passed those two first steps, meaning that it trusts the length of the IP option when copying and using that mem copy, which will corrupt memory given a malformed length. There's another problem here that it just goes through every IP option and try to, tries to copy them, which is a problem because in SSRR there is no really logical uh, way to put more than one. And the RFC states so, and this code does not validate it. So you can put multiple malformed uh, SSRR option and this mem copy will be called with the length and this will result in a stack overflow inside of the IPNet uh, stack and we have successfully exploited this bug in order to execute code inside of VxWorks IP stack. Okay, so this was a cool vulnerability but the next one I think is my favorite. It's really simple and really cute. It's in the reverse ARP uh, protocol. So some of you may ask yourself, what is reverse ARP? You all know ARP, right? You all seen this kind of packet. A client asking the network, where is another client? I want to talk to it, give me the data. Okay, but what if I tell you that you can send a reverse ARP response saying to VxWorks, hey, this is your IP, and VxWorks responds by saying, okay, and adds the IP to the interface. This is a really weird behavior, and to understand it, you need to know that ARP is basically an ancestor to DHCP and it was used back in the day to assign addresses to machines. There's no reason for this was to actually support this. It's obsolete many years now. And the problem here is that VxWorks doesn't validate that it actually sends a reversed ARP request before passing and handling a reply. It just sees a reply and says, okay, I must have asked for an IP address, let's add it, which is great. We have used this bug in order to, in a lot of inside of our research, and most interestingly, there are many devices that had hidden debug features uh, that are binded to a specific IP address. So you can use that to open them pretty easily. Okay, so now I'm gonna transfer it back to Ben that's gonna talk to you about some interesting TCP vulnerabilities. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so that was uh, two of the vulnerabilities. Um, again, the IP options one is the RCE. But we have actually uh, four additional RCEs in the TCP uh, urgent pointer mechanism. And we're going to talk about two of these um, interesting vulnerabilities to, to exploit. So, basic TCP. You have client, you have a server, they want to talk to each other. They do the three way handshake, and then they can talk to each other. You want to learn more about that? I recommend reading this nice book. <laughs> but just for, for the basic uh, understanding here, I want to just go back about what is TCP window and then about the urgent mechanism, urgent data mechanism. So we all know the TCP window uh, from the network aspect of it. It allows one peer to send multiple segments, TCP segments, without needing to wait for acknowledgement of each of them. And that's the TCP window on the network layer. But actually inside the operating system in the implementation of TCP, the TCP window is a buffer inside the kernel uh, that is allocated per TCP connection that saves all the segments that were uh, received in the, in the TCP connection. And once an application wants to read data from this, uh, from the socket, it actually reads from this buffer allocated in the, inside the kernel. So it will call the receive system call with a specified length, and then a portion of that buffer would be copied to the application buffer. So again, the only takeaway from this slide is the TCP window is a buffer inside the operating system. So what is the urgent data mechanism? When you search for TCP urgent data uh, in Google, the first result is a nice answer from Stack Overflow. It says, just don't use urgent data. And the fact is that it actually isn't used by uh, modern applications at all. It's a very ancient mechanism uh, going back to the 80s that was invented to allow one peer to send data inside a TCP connection in an urgent fashion. 
to allow one peer to say to the other, please process this urgent data before you process anything else in the TCP window that maybe has uh, been received before. So that was the purpose of this, but how was it actually implemented? So actually in each TCP header, in each TCP segment, uh, there is allocated the 16 bits of the urgent pointer, and another bit in the TCP flag is the urgent flag. And the urgent pointer is a relative pointer inside the TCP stream that points to where inside the stream uh, the urgent data um, uh, sits. And the urgent flag mean, mean, means this, this specific segment has urgent data in it and the urgent pointer will, will point you to where it is. But there are a few questions that are arising just from this data structure. First, where exactly does the urgent pointer point to? Does it point to the beginning of the urgent data, the end of the urgent data, in the middle, where, where does it point to? And second, there is only an urgent pointer in this, in this structure, there isn't an urgent length. So how long can the urgent data be? So to, to answer these questions, uh, let's go back in time to 1981. Uh, the first hour, there is a, uh, you know, 1981, I was uh, minus six years old, and Dorothy was minus 14 years old, so none of us existed yet. Um, and some guys in the IETF discussed these questions about the urgent data in the non-existent WhatsApp group. And so the first RFC to consider this says, in 1981, says the urgent pointer points to uh, the, the sequence number of the octet following the urgent data. So it points past the urgent data. Okay, sure, sounds uh, simple enough. However, um, six years later, another RFC comes along and says, no, no, the last RFC was wrong. The urgent data actually points to the last octet, not the one that's following it. And two years after that, another RFC comes along and states the same uh, statement. It points to the last octet, not the one that's following it. So there are these uh, contradictions between the RFCs, and in 2011, the latest RFC to consider this came out and said, okay, I don't know how to square this uh, problem, but let's just say that if both sides of the connection agree where the pointer points to, then they, be, they will be able to talk to each other. Uh, but it does state that the default implementation in all the TCP IP stacks uh, until that point in time uh, used the first RFC that says that it points past the last uh, origin datum. Okay, so if you're a TCP IP stack developer, today or in 1987 or anywhere on that timeline, you have to ask yourself, how am I going to implement uh, the urgent data mechanism? What of the RFC, which of the RFCs should I support? And also you need to ask yourself, again, there is the question that we haven't answered yet, what is the length of the urgent data? Actually, the, this last RFC from 2011 does state that because we don't have an urgent length, the urgent data will always be just one byte. So you can see there are these discrepancies in the RFC and this may, might cause implementation problems, which we will uh, show in a second. How does the urgent data mechanism work inside the operating system? Um, so if you are a client that wants to send some urgent data, you need to send it inside the TCP stream, turn on the urgent flag, and the and point the urgent pointer somewhere, I don't know, beginning or end of the urgent data. And then on the server side, uh, you need to see that there is an urgent data in the stream and split the urgent data from the non-urgent data. Then you need to send the server application uh, a signal stating that there's urgent data for him to receive. In Linux, this is SIGURGE. And then uh, the application can call a special receive system call with a special flag message OOB that states, I want to get this urgent data, give it to me. Um, and if we want to receive the regular data, the non-urgent data, it will call the regular receive. So the OS here needs to split the urgent data and the non-urgent data, and it needs to know, uh, depending on what type of receive system call is being called, what type of data to transfer to the server application. And this specific uh, mechanism is what's, uh, uh, what is problematic in VxWorks. Here we can see the function inside the kernel that implements this receive system call in, in VxWorks. And what this code tries to do is understand, okay, I was called with the receive of if x bytes, so uh, I want to copy x bytes from the TCP window to the user space. But if these x bytes contain urgent data, I need to subtract the, le the length field, I need to trim it down so it doesn't contain any urgent data. And this is what happens in this specific field, specific line. So let's go, uh, let's understand the specific line. So let's say a user requested uh, to receive a specific length, but this in the TCP window contains urgent data in the middle and non-urgent data uh, b and before and after that urgent data. So the receive system call wants to trim the length so it doesn't contain any urgent data. So this is done uh, this way. First, 
it, it calculates what is the initial sequence number of the TCP window, of the current TCP window that is done with this, with this uh, two variables. And then it goes to the urgent, that's, we do, you know, you know it this as a sequence start. And then the urgent pointer, uh, in VxWorks, the default is to support this first RFC, so it points past the urgent data. So to get to the beginning of the urgent data, you do this minus one. So now you found where is the length that, that doesn't contain any urgent data. That's good. So, but there are a couple of problems actually in this calculation, and let's see one of them. First of them is the edge case of setting the urgent pointer to zero. As I mentioned before, the urgent pointer is a relative pointer to the current sequence number in the current segment. So the actual variable urgent pointer will be sequence start. If we substitute this uh, in the equation above, we can see that sequence start minus sequence start will, uh, will be gone, and then we will be left with minus one. So length here will be underflow. And this is important because the length is actually an unsigned integer. So what it, once it is underflowed, it will become a very large number. And so it, this code tried to trim down the length, but in essence, the length actually became a very large number. And now the application uh, that tried to call receive with one byte actually gets the entire TCP window. So if we have this simple code here that tries to receive one byte from, the, from a TCP connection to a buffer on the stack, uh, the entire TCP window will be, be copied out of bounds, uh, out of bounds of the application buffer to this, to do this urgent pointer bug. This obviously can cause a stack overflow in this specific case, or if this buffer was allocated on the heap, it can cause a heap overflow. Okay, so this was the code of, uh, this problem was caused by the urgent zero edge case. And this specific bug was actually averted in a, uh, some change of code that was introduced in uh, VxWorks 694. However, there are other problems with this specific line. So we had this urgent pointer problem. We have now other problems, uh, and that one of them is the five-way handshake, we, which we can consider now. So I said that this line has multiple issues, and actually, all four vulnerabilities that we found are some kind of edge cases that we can cause this uh, um, this, this one line to to break. This line has a built-in assumption that the urgent pointer always points beyond the beginning of the TCP window, so one is in front of the other. If that assumption breaks, then this calculation here can underflow. Even without the urgent pointer edge case, it can underflow in other circumstances. There are actually many state confusions that we found uh, that can cause this, um, these two variables, the, the, the connection between them to break. So it's a bit complicated, and I, I won't have time now to go over it uh, uh, in depth. You can read about it in the white paper, but I do want to give one example of this, which is the five-way handshake, what we call it. So you all know about the three-way handshake, and here we have the five-way handshake. These are five packets uh, sent to a VxWorks device that we cause this state confusion in which the urgent pointer and the sequence text, both variables here, will be set at different times. And once that, is, once that happened, then this calculation before we suck an underflow and the same problem with length will occur. So the first packet in the five-way handshake is a SYN packet, regular SYN, but it has a TCP option in it, an AO option that is malformed. And so what VxWorks will do here is actually allocate the socket object and drop the packet, but it won't close the socket at all. It will really leave it open. Now the attacker can send another packet, a fin scene urge packet, that doesn't make any sense. But that packet um, will eventually also be dropped. But it will, in the process of being processed, it will set the urgent pointer relative to the sequence number sent in this specific packet. So now we set the urgent pointer. Um, again, the packet was dropped, so we didn't get any scene act. So the attacker can send another scene packet. And this packet, he will say, uh, this is a regular sin, but he will say, state another sequence number for the initial sequence number. And so now the sequence next variable will, will be set again. So we have achieved what we uh, set out to do, is set the sequence end, next and the urgent pointer at different times, so the connection between them is broken. Eventually now we will get uh, an ACK, a scene ACK, and an ACK, and now we've completed the five-way handshake with these two variables unconnected to each other. If we go back to this equation and we set these um, values in, the, in it, we can see that, um, again, this uh, line will underflow. And once it underflows, again, the length will be cast to an integer, and the receive call from, from any, any server application that calls receive um, in a TCP socket will cause an out-of-bounds out copy. When you look at, on both of these, um, 
uh, vulnerabilities together, they actually impact all VxWorks uh, versions from 6.5 up to the last version released last week uh, or beginning of July, actually. Okay, so there are, there are two RCEs in the TCP uh, implementation. What, what can an attacker do using these specific vulnerabilities? So there is actually an interesting use case for this. Let's consider this example. We have a printer connecting outbound to a Google Cloud printing service. And first of all, it goes out to a DNS server, says what is the IP of the DNS, of the Google Cloud. That will uh, resolve, and then a TLS connection uh, will be created between the print printer and the Google Cloud. So this connection is secure connection, and, and is, because the TLS is encrypted, that connection is secured. But the TCP header act is actually non-encrypted. And the vulnerability we found in, is in the parsing of the TCP header. So if we have an attacker here um, that has some control over the DNS server in this example, then he can uh, be a man in the middle on this connection to the Google Cloud printer. He can say, uh, I am the Google Cloud IP, and so the T TLS connection would be uh, going out to his IP. And now because, again, the vulnerability is in the TCP header, he can change the packet going back from the attacker to the printer. Uh, for example, turn on this urgent zero uh, scenario, and that will uh, exploit the vulnerability on the printer, even if it's behind a NAT, even if it's secured behind a NAT. So this is a very unique example of a device behind a NAT that you can attack from the internet. Um, again, without needing to breach the network at all. Okay, so this is was the TCP uh, urgent, and now we're going to talk about the patient monitor that we have here, uh, just a bit, and Dory will walk you through it. Okay, so we had a lot of fun uh, researching all of these vulnerabilities, and we wanted to find some devices to exploit them on. Uh, this is one interesting case. This is a patient monitor, a bedside uh, hospital patient monitor, and he has a very uh, unique set of qualities. First, it runs VxWorks 6.6, .6, which makes it vulnerable to the Origin Zero uh, variant that we found. It, and it has a listening TCP server that receives to a buffer that is allocated on the heap. That is great because most of the devices that we've seen receives on the stack, so we can get away with a simple stack overflow, but in this case, we need to exploit the heap, which is interesting to us because we haven't done it yet. And the most important quality that it has is when you Google patient monitor VxWorks, it's the first result and you can buy it on eBay. So I'm gonna take you to the three easy steps in order to obtaining the firmware for this device. First, you find it on eBay and you convince the shipper to send it to Israel. Then, you convince your local FDA that you don't need an import license to buy a patient monitor. And once you've done all that, you can open it up and spot a PowerPC JTAG header in it and just dump the firmware. And once we did that, we were not surprised to see that there is no implementation of security and exploit mitigations whatsoever. There is no data execution prevention here, which is supported by VxWorks by turned off. There is no ASLR and there is no kernel user separation. This is not uncommon in this type of devices. Most of the devices that we've seen implement no security feature whatsoever however, which makes exploiting this kind of bugs really, really easy. So this, as I mentioned, it has a TCP port that is listening and receives to a buffer on the heap, which means that we're gonna need to exploit the heap. This was a good opportunity for us to understand how exactly VxWorks heap works and what are the security implications of it. Okay, so as you ima can imagine, VxWorks heap is a pretty trivial heap. No security features are implemented here whatsoever. You have a contiguous memory buffer, which is the heap. You have allocated chunks and free chunks, and every chunk holds their own metadata at the start of the buffer. In case of the allocated chunks, you have the two size D words at the start. You have them also in the free chunk. And right after, you have the mempart pointer. The mempart pointer is a pointer to a global struct that uh, describes the heap. But because, as I mentioned, there is no SLR here, we can predict it every time. So no problem there. And also, we have the head guard, which is supposed to be, I guess, some more security or reliability feature on the heap, but it is determining compilation time of VxWorks, so not much of a security feature, maybe more of a reliability one. In case of the free chunk, you have the same size parameters, but you have a couple of interesting pointers right there, which are the pointers that put the free chunk inside of the heap free list. So what is a heap free list? Basically, it's just a list of doubly linked uh, heap chunks, and every time a user tries to allocate a chunk, the allocator iterates through all of the free chunks and try to find the one that is right sized for the user to allocate. Once it did that, it needs to unlink the free chunk from the free list and then set it as an allocated chunk. 
This happens in a very trivial code inside of the allocator. You might, you might have seen this code on your computer uh, science uh, assignments. This is the basic unlinking of a doubly linked list without any safe unlinking implemented here. Just the previous chunk next is my next and so on. This is pretty trivially exploited when you can overflow those two pointers. And this is called a mirrored right primitive, meaning that once we overflow them with two values that are addressable and also meaningful values, we can create a mirrored right, meaning that one pointer will be written to another and in reverse with some offset between them. So what is our heap exploitation strategy? First, we are overflowing from obviously an allocated heap chunk and hoping to hit a free heap chunk. In this specific case, the statistic were in our favor, so no heap massaging or whatsoever was needed here. We just overflow from our heap chunk right to a free heap chunk and then set those two pointers in order to achieve our mirrored right primitive. Then we wait for someone to allocate this buffer. This happens quite often on the system that buffers get allocated and freed all the time. So now we have our mirrored right and we can write whatever we want, wherever we want. So remember the struct that I told you that describes the heap? It has some interesting function pointers in it. These function pointers are pointers that hooks all the allocation and free uh, functions inside of the memory allocator. And basically we just steal one of them to get execution time and also we can execute code before another allocation occurs or another free occurs so the, the heap will remain intact and we will not destroy anything yet. So once we get some runtime, we will just freeze this region of the heap, we just hook every allocation and every free call that is happening on the system and if someone tries to allocate a buffer from our area that we have destroyed, we just ignore that. And if it tries to free, we just ignore that too. And in the case of an allocation, we just give it another chunk from another place on the heap. We also have a primitive that sets uh, a specific data, uh, a specific data buffer in the data section uh, to values that we control. We won't talk about it, but as I mentioned, there are no depth here, so executing data is pretty easy. And now I'm gonna set up the live demo, and hopefully if we pray to the demo god, it will work. Yeah. Uh, can we switch to the camera under the table? So this is a magic box, but there is a patient monitor under here just for the, uh, it reflects too much for the light, so we uh, put it like this, and I can connect myself. Um, is it yes. Okay. So before door starts, um, this is a patient monitor, like I said, a hospital bedside patient monitor, um, and it can connect to multiple vital readings, so the, uh, pulse, the oxygen, and the EKG, ECG uh, electrodes, which I won't stick to myself, but, but actually do work. Um, and we already run the exploit just before the talk, so, so it's like ready. And this act device actually has a built in debugger, the regular like VXWorks debugger that is turned off by default, but once you run code on it, you can turn on that debugger, and that can be your backdoor to control it various ways. Um, and what we did is upload some code that will allow us to change the vital readings and do all kind of stuff. Uh, so for example, uh, we can uh, change the pulse rating of me and, uh, and the oxygen levels. You can see that I'm not really that excited to see all of you folks. It's just the monitor says otherwise. Uh, and now I'm not dead as well, I'm pretty much alive. <laughs> okay, so we've done that and uh, we can also put whatever we want on the screen. For example, this Blackout logo. Uh, and last thing, like last night, just before going to sleep, I really wanted to see, uh, maybe we can like one doom on this patient monitor. And I didn't have time to actually do it, but I was able to render one frame of doom on the patient monitor. And maybe until last, like the next year, maybe I can actually do doom completely. Okay, so that was the patient monitor. Um, and now, if that also works, we can take some questions. Oh, actually, I do want to summarize a bit um, the, takeovers, the takeaways, and then we'll do the questions. <laughs> okay, so um, we went through a lot of material. Uh, again, very long uh, research with many, many vulnerabilities in it. I think I just wanna go back to a few takeaways from this talk. First, real-time operating systems, I think, are, need to get much more attention from the research community. We, from this example, we saw uh, 2 billion uh, devices running on VxWorks, but only, 30, only 
searching vulnerability is founded in the last 13 years, so there is, there is much more work to be done in researching real-time operating systems, especially the ones that are so, so widely used. Second, we also noticed in this research all these esoteric features from TCP IP stacks that are in practice are not used. The urgent pointers, the reverse ARP, these stuff are not used in practice, but are still implemented in various stacks and create an attack surface that is really not needed. So steps to phase out these specific uh, mechanisms is also needed, I think, uh, both in the stacks and possibly as well in the RFCs. Like a new RFC can come along and state no more urgent pointer. Uh, and lastly, I do think that this research also um, shows the challenge of actually um, finding devices that run VxWorks. So if you would be a researcher for Android or Windows, uh, you can buy an Android phone and you can research it and it's quite easy. If you want to research VxWorks, you need to find out what is the device that runs VxWorks that I can actually uh, use for my research. It's not an easy task to do. There are many, many devices that run VxWorks, but it's not an advertised operating system. It's not something that you go to the store and say, I want to buy a VxWorks device. Um, so there is a challenge in identifying what is this underlying operating system used by many devices, many real-time operating system-based devices. Uh, I think this challenge also needs, uh, we need to, to confront it in order to understand the attack surface of many of the devices that surround us. And we do have 10 minutes, surprisingly, so if you have any questions, there are three mics here. You're welcome to. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, I'm, I've done a lot with IoT, SCADA, ICE. Uh, it seems to be kind of a focus of your company. Um, I'm frankly surprised you only found 13 or 14 that <laughs> you don't have more. No, there's also 11, and there's also 13. Oh, 11. 13 so right, right. I'm surprised you only found 11. Um, have you done much with fragmentation, like the Rose attack, or any kind of TCP IP fragmentation? There was another one that came out recently to uh, basically DDoS these these devices and just shut them down. So I, I'll repeat the question, telling me if you're So you're asking if uh, fragmentation in TCP and IP can cause uh, denial of service on these types of, yeah. So um, we did actually look at this, uh, the implementation of fragmentation, and we didn't find out anything concrete about this, but it is a good, a good uh, target for research. Uh, fragmentation in both IP and TCP can cause uh, implementation bugs, not in this instance, though. Look up, look up the Rose attack. What again? Rose attack, it's online. Oh, yeah, like I mentioned, I think before, there are many vulnerabilities that cause like resource exhaustion, denial of service in the application there. But, but getting it to denial of service that actually reboots the device or uh, causes remote code execution, that's another type of attack. Thank you. Sure. Uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Uh, really interesting work. Did, uh, at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that the same TCP IP stack is used in ThreadX. Did you guys also investigate to see if you could accomplish uh, these same exploits in ThreadX? So we, we haven't. Uh, actually, what we understood from Green River, uh, which is now owns IPNet, is that since 2006, when they purchased um, IPNet, these other real-time operating systems no longer use IPNet. Uh, but it is something to consider, yeah. He just stole my question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would control for integrity block your uh, exploits attempt? Can, can you come in? Would control flow integrity block your exploits oh, attempt? Oh, well, that's really not something that exists in VxWorks devices. I think there are much basic stuff that can uh, prevent these attacks from being such easy to exploit. Uh, you know, the door mentioned this, uh, no ASLR, no depth, um, no stack canaries. They're not implemented in practice in many of uh, VxWorks-based devices. And if you will add another mitigation to that, it will help even more. <laughs>